for the live to start and yeah so we are live now i'll first introduce uh, karina and the festival and then she will be moderating the session for me okay uh, so hello everyone good morning good afternoon and good evening a warm welcome to day 5 session 6 of the third international conference and pop festival for youth led climate action 2021 We are delighted to have you all join us for one of the biggest youth led events for climate action. My name is Rusha Pathak. I'm a public health professional and a pop youth mentor at the pop movement. The pop family is excited to welcome you to this session which will focus on the topic topic climate pollution. In this keynote address, Ms Elizabeth will empower youth with viable climate solution that can be implemented to mitigate climate change. Now I would like to invite uh Ms. Karina Weston, uh, Program Strategy and Innovation Director, FXB International. We'll be putting our uh, social media handles and hashtags in the chat, so please follow follow them and use the hashtag to tag us on any of the social media channels. Over to you, Karina. Thank you, thank you so much, Trisha, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, work together for this Pop Festival 2021. So we're really thrilled to welcome our keynote address today and our keynote address will focus on climate solutions. I know that we're all here because we're positive and hopeful about our ability to work together to combat climate change and so I'm especially thrilled to present Dr. Elizabeth Bagley who is the director of Drawdown Learn a project Drawdown. Dr. Elizabeth Bagley connects people with the most impactful climate change solutions through a diverse portfolio of programming Uh, Elizabeth creates relevant research and relatable sustainability content and initiatives that inspire audiences to take action to help people and the planet thrive together. Before joining Project Drawdown, Elizabeth directed sustainability efforts at the California Academy of Sciences and designed the science content for video games at Leapfrog. Elizabeth has experience studying coral reefs, sea turtles, and butterflies in Kenya. and has worked as a naturalist in Glacier National Park and today Elizabeth is joining us from Alaska so oh, turn it over to you thank you so much for your time today oh my gosh hi everybody it's so good to be here thank you so much for the warm welcome and thanks for uh thanks for taking climate action everybody we need you now more than ever. So I'm going to start um sharing some slides and talking a bit about the climate solutions that we know exist today. So I'm just going to do a quick check are we seeing the slides okay everybody? Great. All right. Well, let's start here. Um in first with a a land acknowledgement. So um as Karina said and thanks again Karina, I'm Elizabeth Bagley. I use she her pronouns and I'm coming to you from Sitka, Alaska, which is occupied land of the Tlingit. And here's an an image of Sitka, Alaska. So those of you who haven't visited, we'd love to have you visit any time. Um I'd like to first start out by inviting you to jump in the chat and answer this question. What comes to mind when you think of climate change and global warming? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat, please. All right, thank you. So we already have people filling it up. We have childhood asthma, suffering, life at risk, need for action, our earth in pain, an urgency to act, hope, potential for a shift. Collective uh <clears throat> working together, being a uh, uh people working together coming together to work to work in this space. You all, thank you for sharing. You know, climate change and global warming can feel so overwhelming and this question is not a question um unique to me it's actually a question that was asked of 14,000 people around the world and when those 14,000 people were asked this question 44% of them talked about the outcomes of climate change things like um changing weather melting ice caps the really scary things that we're seeing now on our planet about 18% of those 14,000 people around the world talked about the causes they talked about things like the burning of fossil fuels like coal oil and natural gas and here's where it gets interesting now you all are a bit different and i love that because you already know what you're showing up for you're showing up for solutions but only 3% of those 14,000 people 
said anything about solutions. And this, everybody, this is an incredible opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to step up and step into our communities and start to put these climate solutions into action that will make our homes, our businesses, our communities thrive into the future. So my hope is that today, after this conversation, solutions are going to actually be one of the first things that comes to mind when you think about climate. Um, and you're already doing incredible things in that space right now. Let's think about some other options, some other solutions that you might not know about, because there are a lot. So this is an image of all of the solutions that Project Drawdown has looked at over the past few years. We are focused solely on climate solutions. Our organization is called Project Drawdown. We're the world's leading resource for climate solutions. We came up with a book in 2017, and in 2020, we updated the book with this free resource. It's available on our website, which is drawdown.org. Uh, it's called the Drawdown Review, and it talks about um, the latest and greatest climate solutions, as well as um, the impact of those solutions across the globe. So you might be wondering, well, you kind of have a weird name, Project Drawdown. What does that mean? Well, great question. Our name actually comes from a scientific term that indicates a future point in time when the levels of those heat trapping gases in our atmosphere stop climbing and start to steadily decline. Now this, everybody, this point right here, that blue dot, is the moment of drawdown. And that is a critical turning point for life on earth. And it's a point that we need to reach as quickly, as safely, and as equitably as possible. But how do we get there? How are we actually gonna reach drawdown? Well, I want you to imagine that this rectangle is all of those heat trapping gases that humans are putting into the atmosphere year over year. Now, where do those come from? Where, where are those gases originating from? Thankfully, we know. We know that about a quarter of those heat trapping gases are coming from the ways we use and produce electricity. About another quarter are coming from the ways in which we produce food, the ways we use land, and, and, and the ways we um, were growing crops as well as animals on this planet. So that's another quarter. 21% uh, come from industry, making the stuff that we use in our lives. 14% comes from transportation. 6% uh, from buildings and about 10% uh, from other energy related emissions. Now, these are global numbers. This is what the atmosphere is seeing. These numbers likely look a little different depending on where you live. So it's important for you to kind of know where the where the heat trapping gases are coming from in your uh, in your area. But globally, this is where they're coming from. And the story doesn't stop there. Thankfully, we have uh, what are called land sinks. For those of you who remember photosynthesis, we are super grateful for plants for actually sequestering carbon or for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and using it to power their, to power their, um, their, to photosynthesize. And so about 24% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are removed in land sinks and another 17% by coastal and ocean sinks. So our land and our coasts and our oceans are critical parts of this climate equation. But for those of you who are doing some math, that still leaves about 59% of those heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. And those are causing this thick, this thick blanket around our planet. So we know where the gases come from, we know where they go, and we know there's still a bunch left over. What in the world can we do about it? Well, thankfully, we can flip the sources on their head and say, you know what, if those are the sources of those heat trapping gases, then they also must be the solutions to stopping those greenhouse gases. So we need to turn off all of those taps. So this, everybody, is the start to the framework for uh, drawdown framework for climate solutions. So the first S that we want to think about is sources. We want to reduce the sources of those heat trapping gases. And you'll notice these are the same categories that we just talked about in terms of um, the sources. So we want to reduce them. The second S is sinks. We want to support and enhance the natural sinks that we see on this incredible planet. And the third S is society. We want to help society achieve broader transformation. So here it is, the moment of truth, everybody. Boom, this is it. The drawdown framework for climate solutions. If you can remember one thing today, really three things, sources, sinks, and society, right? Those three S's are the solutions that we have in place. And there's lots of them, over 80 solutions we know, but they fit into those three buckets. We're reducing sources, we're supporting sinks, and we're improving society. That is pretty amazing. So what I'm going to do today 
is I'm going to provide you with uh, an overview of climate solutions that we have in hand today. These aren't things that are going to take 10, 20, 30 years to get into place. We have all these solutions today, and they can help us reach drawdown and begin to come back into balance with the planet's living systems. And really, um, these solutions are tools of possibility. They're tools of possibility in the face of a seemingly impossible challenge. And we know that widespread awareness and understanding of climate solutions is absolutely vital to kindle agency and affect change worldwide. And while you might not all want to join climate marches, we need people and institutions of all kinds in all places to play a role in this great transformation. You could see he is a solar installer. So maybe that's more interesting and more exciting for you than going to a climate march. We need all of it. We need everybody, whatever your superpower is, let's bring it to the table. So today we're gonna to talk about these solutions. And one of the things I want you to uh, consider also is that climate solutions don't just address those heat trapping gases. Climate solutions are almost always uh, have co-benefits. And co-benefits mean that, for example, in this picture, we're looking at a clean cook stove. So not only are we talking about reducing the sources, reducing the um, heat trapping gases, we also are creating health solutions by reducing indoor air pollution. So it's a climate solution and it's a human health solution. Other, other solutions, for example, this one that uh, protects and restores ecosystems are also biodiversity solutions. And many climate solutions can create jobs. They foster resilience to climate impacts like storms and droughts. And they bring lots of other environmental benefits like safeguarding our water resources. So we know that climate solutions can and need to advance social and economic equity if they're used wisely and well. And if we pay attention to who decides, who benefits, and how any drawbacks are mitigated. And in this space, it takes intention, it takes care, and it takes a bunch of courage to move solutions forward in ways that heal rather than deepen systemic injustices. So we have the opportunity and the obligation to co-create these systems that are safe and equitable, ensuring that both people and the planet can thrive together. Now, I'm gonna throw you a cultural reference that some of you uh, may know about, others may not. I'm dating myself here, but. I wanna introduce you for those of you who don't know to Mr. Rogers. Now, Mr. Rogers was one of the most impactful educators of all time. He had a television show on the um, public broadcasting service in the United States for over 30 years. And lots of people learned about their neighborhoods through Mr. Rogers. So one of the things that, that I wanna think about today is that you know we create we as humans created our neighborhoods and we continue to decide make decisions and, and design our neighborhoods to meet our needs. And that's amazing because we, as the people alive today, have the opportunity to really re-envision and reinvent our neighborhoods. How do we wanna make sure that we are putting climate solutions center, we're putting justice center to the changes that we're making? So. Um, you know, all those climate solutions that I that I mentioned earlier, those do not happen unless there are people in our neighborhoods who are actually putting them into place. And also another thing Mr. Rogers helped us with was playing a bit of make-believe. He had this whole land of make-believe. And so I invite you all to think about what kind of world you want to live in. How can you imagine the world and then make it happen? And so that's what we're here to do today. So we know that climate solutions don't come to life on their own. And I wanna highlight these eight people. Now these eight people are from um, uh, really different backgrounds and they're all working in climate ready careers. So you might not have thought about it before but every job can be a climate job. If you're an accountant, maybe you choose to be an accountant at a, um, a climate focused nonprofit rather than going to um, work at another organization that isn't focusing on climate, but every job can be a climate job. So we're gonna talk a bit about these folks. They are highlighted in this documentary. The website is at the bottom. Um, this great documentary created by Climate Generation where they really uh, dive into the, um, to the career. So highly recommend checking it out. So with that, we're gonna dive into sources and we're gonna think about some of the solutions that can help us reduce the sources of those heat trapping gases. And we're gonna start with the electricity sector. And I'm gonna hang on this slide for a minute just so we can kind of 
orient ourselves to it. What you're seeing on this slide, um, so we have the electricity sector, and we know that the solutions kind of fit into three big buckets. One bucket is shifting production. We need to shift the production of our electricity away from the burning of fossil fuels towards more renewable sources of energy, like wind, like solar, like geothermal. On, uh, next to that, we know we need to enhance efficiency. We need to be much more efficient with the ways we're using the electricity. Let's not waste it. Enhancing efficiency is gonna be a common theme throughout many of the solution areas. And we need to improve the system. We need to make sure that our electrical system works well for everybody all the time. So um, what you're seeing, you're seeing the solution clusters and then you're seeing the individual solutions within those clusters. Some of the circles are bigger, some are smaller. Um, these are all based on two different scenarios of reaching 1.5 or two degrees of warming increase. And, um, uh, and the size of the circles are, scaled relative to one another. So the bigger the circle means the bigger the potential impact if it was scaled at the, at the um, if it was scaled to the level that we modeled it at. So when you see bigger, it doesn't necessarily mean better. So for example, I mean, it, it means that it could have a huge impact, but it doesn't mean that the smaller things are any less important. What I really want us to remember is that this is a whole mosaic of solutions and we need all of these pieces put into place for us to reach drawdown. And that brings me to introduce you to the first person, Jamez Staples. Now, Jamez is the CEO of a, a company called Renewable Energy Partners in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he was like, hey, I want to work on poverty alleviation and I want to work on climate change, those co-benefits. So he decided to work on climate solutions by developing community solar projects that are placed in really high density urban areas. And they provide solar subscriptions for low income households. Um, talk about a, beauty, a beautiful story of really um, climate solutions meeting co-benefits. But Jamez can't do his job without people like Kevin Brown. And Kevin is a solar installer, and he puts climate solutions into place in communities. Now, if you check out the documentary, you'll hear that solar installers and wind turbine service technicians are actually two of the fastest growing jobs in the United States right now. So how might you consider this kind of career pathway for the work that you wanna do in your life? So that's a couple examples of what's going on in um, the electricity sector. Let's jump though to food, agriculture, and land use. Now, solutions in this sector cluster around addressing food waste and diets, on shifting our agricultural practices, and on protecting our ecosystems. Now, today, what I wanna talk about is um, what I sometimes call uh, the world's dumbest problem, which is food waste, right? And the reason I say it's kind of dumb is because why are we wasting food, right? When we waste food and about, um, depending on, on the numbers, about a third of the world's food is wasted. It's never eaten, which means that all of the heat trapping gases emitted uh, in producing the food were completely unnecessary, not to mention all the labor, all the farmland on and on, like all of that was for nothing. Imagine like going to the grocery store, buying three bags of groceries and just leaving one in the parking lot and not even bringing it home. That's what at a, um, at a global scale, that's what we're wasting every single day. Like, let's not, let's not do that, right? So there's great ways for us to kind of rethink systems to not waste food. And one example is this waste audit. So for those of you who um, eat in a cafeteria, uh, this is an, an example in a high school where the students sorted out their waste to figure out what could be recycled, what could be um what had to go to the landfill and what could actually be composted. So instead of throwing the food scraps into the landfill, they worked with a local compost company to um, come up with ways to get those uh, nutrients back into the soil. So this is an incredible program. It's called Lunch Out of Landfills. There is a toolkit if you want to learn more about it and possibly start it in your own area. Um, I highly recommend something like this. And if you want a job where you think about this all the time, someone like Natalie Jacobson is a great role model. She's actually a kitchen coordinator where she goes to farmers markets and she recovers the extra fruits and vegetables that aren't being that aren't selling and she donates that to people in the community who don't have e easy access to fruits and vegetables talk about an awesome way to reduce waste reduce food waste and uh, reduce hunger so thanks to people like natalie we've got some amazing solutions and amazing careers focus on food agriculture and land use 
All right, industry is the next area that we look at. And this one, um, the areas of action really focus on using waste. Like let's, if we have waste, let's actually put it to use. This is another example of where composting can come in. Uh, addressing refrigerants and improving materials. Now refrigerants might sound like something that only big companies can work on. No, they should work on it, yes. And we can actually do something about it too. So refrigerants, um, the trademark name is, is often Freon, if you've heard of that before. Um, they are potent heat trapping gases. And it makes sense, right? Because the molecules um, are great at trapping heat. That's what they do. They're found in our air conditioners. They're found in our refrigerators. They keep heat out of the places that we want to stay cold. But the problem is they do their job really well. So during use and during disposal of air conditioners and refrigerators, these pesky refrigerants are often, um, they often leak. And when they leak, they keep doing their job in the atmosphere. And that's where someone like Elise Sorensen is awesome because Elise is a chemist. So she works for an organization called Train Technologies, where she really tries to understand how she can make refrigerants that don't trap heat in the atmosphere. Only do your job where you're supposed to do your job. Don't do your job if you go into the atmosphere. So she's working on really exciting innovations in that space. So how cool is it that the chemistry classes that we might have taken in the math classes can be directly related to climate solutions. And if you want to learn more about that, another great resource is the Solutions Journalism Network. And the Solutions Journalism Network curates stories, instead of them being doom and gloom stories about the state of the world, they curate stories that are about climate solutions. So for example, with refrigerants, there's this set of five stories uh, focus on what people are doing around the world, as well as some external links for you to learn more. So uh, I've got the URL at the bottom. This is a great resource if you want to learn more about any of the solution areas, really from a solutions in communities focus. All right, industry, we're going to move into transportation. And we know that with transportation, we need to shift to alternatives. We need to get out of gas guzzling vehicles we need to enhance efficiency and we need to electrify our vehicles. Now, in lots of places around the world, for example, in the US, there's a group called Safe Routes to School and they support walking or riding school buses. So instead of having a big um, gasoline or diesel powered school bus, they get a whole bunch of kids together to walk together or to bike together. And they call that a riding or walking school bus. And so kids are getting exercise and they're reducing heat trapping emissions from transportation which is amazing, winning all around. Now, there's another thing. So I live, as I mentioned, I live in Sitka, Alaska, which is an island. And so we can bike and walk quite a, quite a bit. We only have 14 miles of road, but sometimes we need to use cars. And that's where someone like Jokoka Conan comes in. He is an electric vehicle consultant and he works um, you know, in a really rapidly changing space. And in a place like Sitka on an island, we really need to have people trained on electric, electric vehicle maintenance or else people can't have electric vehicles. So it's important to think about the whole infrastructure that's needed to make some of these changes stick all around the world. Think we're gonna wrap up sources now by talking about buildings. And we have lots of emissions that come from buildings specifically from um, our, the energy sources. So we wanna shift our energy sources. We wanna address those pesky refrigerants and we want to enhance efficiency. Now, um, that's where someone, uh, that's where someone like Marshall Westford comes in. Now, Marshall is actually installing a low flow shower head in, here in this home. And so solutions like installing insulation or low flow fixtures are just one time actions. You do it once and you never have to do it again. And that can be encouraged across your entire community. You know, could you work with a local company to get some donations of low flow shower heads? Because when you change the shower head once, you're reducing the amount of energy that's needed to heat water because we have to heat hot water unless you take a cold shower, but most of us probably take uh, use some heat with our shower. You're also reducing the water and you're reducing um, wastewater. So that's a pretty awesome solution right there. That's just one and done. You don't have to worry about that again. So that can have a big impact on, on the heat trapping gases, on comfort, on budgets and on jobs. And another job in this space is um, someone like Katie Reamer. Katie is a renewable energy specialist and Katie comes into people's homes and does energy audits to help us figure out how we can use less energy and be more efficient in our homes. And there are so many careers that can make 
our homes, our schools, our community buildings, much more energy efficient. And those careers are really diverse and they are found all over the world. They are careers like construction and manufacturing and um, uh, changing the way that we use energy in our homes. Whew, we just did a bunch of sources, y'all. We can reduce sources. There are so many solutions there. That was the first S, sources. Second S, sinks on land and in the ocean. This one's kind of overwhelming, and that's awesome because there are so many solutions related to really helping land do what it does best, right? Helping photosynthesis happen. So we can focus on better agricultural practices, on protecting and restoring ecosystems, on using degraded land, and of course, addressing food waste and diets. That comes back up here. Now, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Okaga, who is an agriculture agricultural, excuse me, extension agent. So lots of universities around the world have extension agents that work, they, they kind of build a bridge from the universities into the community, specifically into the agricultural area. So Dr. Ukaga can work with researchers to find the best, the most efficient agricultural solutions. And then he can communicate that directly to farmers, really supporting this multi-region food system, kind of coming back to the importance of thinking about systems. And just to remind us, like we all, um, we created these systems and so we can change them. And that's an incredible opportunity. So that's what we're going to talk about with land. We're going to move into ocean. And this one looks a little sad because we actually have researchers working right now on expanding the solution set. So please don't feel like um, the ocean and coastal areas are not important. They are critically important to um, the, being a, a sink for, uh, for those heat trapping gases. We just are expanding the set right now. And um, one job you might not think about that's related to these solutions is actually the job that Anna Vang took. So she is a policy associate within local government. So for those of you who want to work in government, who want to work on policy, this could be a really cool role for you. Um, Anna reads and summarizes information for the mayor so that the policymakers are informed about the latest research related to climate. You know, the climate space is rapidly changing. And if you want to be on that bleeding edge of, of uh, policy, this kind of job might be great for you. All right. We talked about sources. We talked about sinks. And the last S is society. So we know that specifically um, access to education and um, high quality voluntary reproductive health care are fundamental human rights, and they are cornerstones of gender equality. In more indirect ways, making strides in health and education can also benefit the climate. What an awesome co-benefit right there. Now, for those of you who are interested in learning more about this space, I highly recommend um, a uh, a website called the Drawdown Eco Challenge. And this is one way that communities engage in climate solutions. It's super fun. It's social. You can take measurable action. Here's what it looks like. Um, it runs year round and you can create teams and track your progress all while putting climate solutions into place. And there's actually a youth focused one. It's not running right now, but you can peek around at it and really find solutions that might be more applicable to uh, the work that you're doing. I also want to mention in terms of um, health and education. Uh, Project Drawdown partnered with Unity, which is a company that builds a game engine or a platform that 90% um, that of mobile games around the world are built on. And we worked with them on an environment and sustainability grant where game designers all over the world could come together uh, and submit proposals for games, for video games that are incorporating the environment and sustainability into the game. So stay tuned, that just wrapped up. We're in the process of judging and I can't wait to share the winners with you. So if that's something, you could also be a video game designer and integrate climate content into the work you're doing. So everybody, if we do all these things, if we reduce the sources, that's a first S, by implementing solutions focused on electricity, on food, agriculture, and land use, industry, transportation, and buildings. If we support sinks on land and in the ocean, and if we improve society through healthcare and education, we can actually reach drawdown. Now, I've shared some climate solution stories with you today. I shared a bunch of careers, but what do you want to do? What's your next step going to be? Well, here's one next step that you might want to take. We have a new video series. It's six units. The URL is at the bottom here. Um, it's a video series filled with the latest need to know science and fascinating insights from global leaders 
in climate policy, in research, investment, and more. And this video series really is a brain shift toward a brighter climate uh, reality. So I highly encourage you to check this out. And I'd like to invite you back to the chat. And I'd love to know now what comes to mind when you think of climate change and global warming. Yeah, I can read it out. Um, oh, thanks, Karina. That people are posting. Let me see if I can navigate ahead of. Um, so Aman said, I think it's just beautiful how you've created a project where specialized people act as pillars of the entire foundation tackling climate change. Sorry, my computer is not letting me scroll. I can see it, Karina. I can help jump in there. And especially focusing Thank on you. multiple approaches that can be incorporated into managed uh, to restore the balance and actually achieve sustainability. Thanks so much for that amazing comment. We have hope, we have opportunity, we have hope, we have coming together, we have harmony, we have community, we have the pop movement. We have coming together, we have connecting. You all, what happened? This is amazing. I wanna do like a, oh yeah, pop in all caps. Oh my gosh, I have, I have like goosebumps here. Pop with like 500 exclamation points again and again. Okay, we're just gonna say, you all do not need to do this together, right? You have this movement and that is so powerful that you can work together. You can support each other as you put climate solutions into place all around the world. I seriously still have goosebumps. You all are inspiring me so much. And look at this. We've got so many solutions. I hope you've been introduced to some new ones that maybe you hadn't thought of or hadn't heard of before, because it really will take a whole ecosystem of activities of actors to create and accelerate the kind of transformation that's required. So I'm gonna show you another, another picture of Sitka here and, and ask you, what do you wanna to reach towards? You know, the reality of intervening in this kind of a complex system is that no one can do it all. And we all have an opening to show up at, uh, to show up, right? We can show up as problem solvers and change agents and contribute in significant ways, even when we feel small. So. We have a choice as a society and we have a choice to make about what shape that transformation will take. Will we employ the collective courage and determination and the diversity of solutions to move the world towards a balance with the planet's living systems? Will we pursue climate action in ways that heal systemic injustices and foster resilience, well-being and equality? So who do we wanna be at this pivotal moment in human history? because we know that together, the pop movement, all of us coming together to work on solutions, we can build a bridge from where we are today to the world that we want for ourselves, for all life, and most importantly, for generations yet to come. We know that a better path is still possible. So let's turn that possibility into reality. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was very inspiring. Um, I urge everyone to um, put questions into the chat box. And I'll just start us off. You know, it's really, um, it's really encouraging to see so many viable climate solutions. Um, what do you see as a pathway to getting these climate solutions implemented on a larger scale? Yeah, well, thanks so much, Karina, for thinking about that. Because um, what I've been thinking about a lot lately is, while it's super helpful that Project Drawdown uh, did the analysis to understand what the solutions are, the most important thing now is that people start to put them into place in their communities, right? And so I think um, to scale, sharing our information, not kind of hoarding it. And there's a great website that I should share with y'all too um, that might give you some good ideas for, um, for some work that you might want to do. There's an organization that actually I'm going to give you the generic, the non-US focused version of it. Let me double check this real quick. Um, this is, it's called, they're called changex, changex.org. And what they're doing is super great. They are focusing, oh, you know what? I didn't send you quite the right link. Uh, let me slow down a little bit more on that one. Um, they are looking at, uh, environmental solutions all around the world and they are creating blueprints. So they're like, Hey, don't reinvent the wheel. We have lots of wheels that work. Let's try on one of these wheels. So you can, if you wanted to, for example, um, start community composting, you could look at ChangeX and get a step-by-step -step guide on how to do community composting. So there's lots of great ideas there. So Karina, to answer your question more succinctly, I would say uh, to scale, 
work together. Don't work on your own. That's what's so great about what y'all are doing here with the pop festival that you can find people like-minded people to work together. And um, I would say to stay focused on your goal. There's lots of shiny objects that can distract people in this space where people are like, oh, you know what? Technology is going to save us. We don't need technology to save us. We have enough solutions today, right now to reach drawdown. We need action. We need people to step up and put stuff into place in their communities. And then I would add one more thing, Karina, which is um, to have people listen, to listen to your community, right? To be really, um, to engage with people, to hear what they need, to look for those moments of intersection or those co-benefits. What can also reduce those heat trapping gases and improve human health or improve biodiversity? Like where can we get those co-benefits? Because that's gonna be an even bigger win for the planet and for people moving forward. Thank you so much. So I hear take action. That's really the way to scale these solutions. So what is some advice um, or your thoughts on how youth can implement these solutions? Because young people can listen and say, well, you know, I can't change refrigerants, right? But what are some ways that young people can advocate for these climate solutions? Yeah, I think there's lots of lots of different ways to do it. We've got a um, in the drawdown review, we actually have a whole section focused on what we call um, accelerators. They're basically levers that we can all pull. So that really depends on your superpower. For some of us, we really want to work on policy. So go to your city council meetings, listen to what's being talked about and speak up during those meetings about what you care about so people know. That's one thing to do, right? Like we can work on, on policy. For those of you who don't wanna work on policy, you might wanna work on, um, on behavior change. Maybe there's something in your school or in your community where you can start to nudge people to change their behavior in certain ways. Um, maybe there's a way that you personally can invest money differently. We need to shift money, right? We want to make sure, and there's a big movement right now, um, especially from organizations like 350.org and the Sunrise Movement to really make sure that the money that when we put money into the economy, that we're putting it into companies that are um, committed to climate action. So thinking about you know how you uh, how you invest money and things like that is also really important. So lots and lots of ways. Um, also to work with you know with the pop festival and people in this space about uh, learning from each other so that the so that you don't have to start from zero. Thank you. That's really helpful. And just one more question. Um, out of, so there are 80 viable climate solutions that Project Drawdown identified. Out of those, are there any that you would say are should be prioritized? So it depends. Uh, so the, the answer is, it's we need all of the solutions implemented as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. But it depends where you live. For example, um, having a huge solar array in a mountainous region like Sitka, Alaska, where I live, isn't a great option, right? That's not a great option, but maybe offshore wind turbines are. Offshore wind turbines are not a good idea in the middle of India, but maybe, um, you know, maybe that's a great place for a large solar arrays or, or onshore wind turbines, right? So really thinking about what makes sense for your community and finding those co-benefits, right? Finding the solutions that are gonna make life even better for people because they are human health solutions or biodiversity solutions or they're creating jobs. You know, most of these climate solutions are going to create jobs anyway. So Karina, I would say there's not like, there's not one answer that there's not one perfect solution. There are a whole lot of perfect solutions and it depends on where you live and on what, what kind of superpower you wanna tap into to get that solution into place. Yeah, that's really inspiring. So there's really kind of room and space for everyone to take action in a way that feels right to them and the way that's needed in their community. That's really, really powerful. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the audience? I don't know if I can manage the chat box. Uh, uh, Ivan wants to ask a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ivan. You could just unmute yourself. Thank, thank you. So my question is, what has been your proudest moment or your greatest achievement by now? The one that makes you like the happiest or yeah, like I would like to know what inspires you and yeah, 
I'm going to stop right, right there and let you answer. Thank you so much for, for the really lovely question. Wow. Well, so I can, I guess I can talk about a couple different things. What inspires me? Um, I am really inspired by nature. I mean, you could see the picture in my background is from when I was kayaking. Like I love being outside. I love just, I always, uh, amazed at the complexity and the beauty of this planet. And that inspires me because I can learn a lot from the planet, um, you know, kind of lessons from lessons from our planet uh, and to care for it, right? To make sure that since we are the people who are lucky enough to live on this planet at this pivotal moment, how can we really make sure that we're caring for both people and the planet? So I get really inspired by nature. I also get really inspired when I um, hear about people implementing climate solutions in kind of unique ways. I mean, any way is great, but really unique ways really um, is inspiring to me. So for example, before I was at Project Broadown, I was at the California Academy of Sciences, which is a museum in San Francisco. And um, there's a, a fun story where um, the, we, we had over 40,000 live animals that had to be fed you know, mostly every day. And so the animal commissary, the kitchen that prepared the meals for the animals, they would get their food delivered. And then the people commissary, you know, the cafe for all the guests upstairs got their food delivered. But one day the food for the animals went to the human cafe. And so the person who was in charge of the animals was like, where's all my food? So he wandered upstairs and they realized that they were buying from the same place and so the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the animal, uh, the person focused on the animal diets said, well, wait a second, what do you do with your bruised bananas? And the chef said, well, I usually just compost them because I don't, you know, I don't eat them. And he's like, no, 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 no. The bruised bananas are the favorites for the butterflies in the rainforest exhibit. Let's not waste the food. Let's not even, let's not compost it. Let's instead like make sure we're going to give it its highest value and use it as food. And then, so now every week when there is imperfect produce, right? Like if there's a bruised apple, if there's a bruised banana or anything, um, that goes to the animals instead of going into the compost or the landfill, which is just, I know it's a small story, but I love when people start to ask questions and think of themselves as um, change agents. Like, oh, wait a second, we can, do, we can do things differently. It doesn't have to be done the way it's always been. And I think it's gonna take a lot of that kind of thinking for us to reach drawdown. And so that seriously, Yvonne, inspires me a lot because I love having people think like change agents. So thanks for that fun question. Thank you, Yvonne. We have a question from Alexa. From your perspective, how could people go about connecting smaller organizations in their communities that may be working on similar and or related issues so that the efforts may be magnified? Thanks so much, Alexa, for that question, because I think we are stronger and better together, right? And we do not necessarily need to reinvent wheels. So I've seen a couple of different ways that this collaboration can work. Uh, in San Francisco, we had um, an organization, there is still a, this incredible organization called the Business Council on Climate Change. And that, uh, the Business Council on Climate Change brings together a lot of local business leaders. Uh, so for example, Google and Facebook, a lot of companies you've heard of to help the city reach their climate goals. So they come together and they're like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? So that they can share instead of compete in that space. So you might think about starting something like that in your community with business leaders. I've also seen that work with, um, with nonprofits. We had a group um, called Change Scale, again, in the San Francisco Bay Area that brought together environmental nonprofits to focus on environmental education and to really um, expand the best practices of environmental education. We had another group called Bay Click that brought together all of the informal environmental educators. So the people who worked at museums and uh, national parks and who worked in school gardens. And we would come together and share best practices on messaging about climate. There's a great organization. I can put that in the, uh, the chat. It's called Climate Interpreter. And Climate Interpreter um, has a lot of Oops, hold on, I did the wrong one. Climate interpreter. Um, 
they have great trainings and um, that might be helpful for those of you who want to come together around a training. And the other thing I will say is that in, in Sitka, where I live now, we have this lovely monthly meeting. Um, it's called Wuchin. We live on, you know, Clinket land, and that's a Clinket word that means um, coming together and, and working together in community. And um, so we have a, a virtual meeting with different leaders of nonprofits every month. And we just talk about what we're working on. So I think that kind of collaboration, bringing people together, having a space to do it is super, super important. Alexa, I love that your um, thoughts of like, that's really how we magnify our action and really what it takes just to do that, just to be totally like get into the weeds. It takes somebody to step up and lead, right? Like it takes somebody to say, I'm going to send out the meeting invites. I'm going to come up with the agenda and let's come together and talk. It doesn't just happen on its own. So Alexa, I'd invite you and anybody else who wants to lead in that space, um, that you can be the leader, right? Like you could start that and really bring your community together. So great, great idea. Thanks so much for bringing that up, Alexa. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. You gave us so much to think about the drawdown framework, the three S's, the climate careers. I was really inspired to see all the different climate careers. Uh, beyond, you know, what I think most people think of maybe like an engineer or a scientist. And of course, all the really valuable tools to take action in our communities and globally. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ash to give a few closing words. Absolutely. I, I want to say thank you so much. This has been such um, an energizing and a highly enlightening and, and informative session. And I just, uh, I want to also start by saying, um, Elizabeth, that I'm a quote unquote graduate of, <laughs> of Drawdown. So like I follow, follow all of the content and material. And I have to say that it's, it's, um, you know, our tagline is youth inspired by knowledge. And, uh, you know, you've underscored that over and over. Uh, and I just want to say that, you know, in the manner in which you bring together materials, the science, uh, scientists, and a range of different actors uh, from across the field, it's, it's, it's absolutely, um, you know, bright and enlightening to, to I think, all, all audiences, it's not just young people, I think everyone, and it's so consumable. So I just want to thank Thank you very much for for that and uh, I do think the, the whole idea really is to look at uh, look at um, the bright side the fact of the matter is that we do have opportunity uh, that taking action is key no doubt and that our time is now uh, but I think you know you exemplify that and 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 in all your work and everything you do and your love and passion for nature is is very very inspiring um, I, I, I just uh, want to say that, you know, uh, it's, it's been a great pleasure to be able to hear you and, and um, to learn about all the amazing things that you're doing. And of course, there's a range of opportunity. I just uh, want to tell everybody over here that we have, we have much to do, but uh, the great thing is that there is hope and there's light. So let's make it happen. And I just want to add one more thing that, uh, you know, as we mobilize more people and as we collectivize, uh, the important thing is to bring out the best in everyone. I think we have potential. Everybody has potential and everybody has a beautiful and bright side. It's a matter of, of really bringing that out. And I think Elizabeth's words uh, and um, presentation and session here has, has really sort of brought that to the fore. So I wanna convey my thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. We take your words to heart and want to be able to, um, to really be together beyond just today and do lots more. And again, I think you brought up an important point, you know, not everybody's into perhaps strikes, perhaps, um, you know, a range of other things that, that might be out there and in the news a whole lot, but every, everything you do uh, matters. So, you know, pick what it is that is your passion and uh, turn it to, yeah, turn it to a reality that can, yeah, change the course of history and that you have the potential, uh, I have no doubt. So um, together we'll do it. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Karina, for, for your leadership. I mean, you really, really ooze that 
uh, that th those values, that wisdom, that coming together and truly your family, as are as is every other person over here, and so many more that we're so blessed to be family with. I also want to thank all the amazing young stars, the bright and shining stars, our mentors. Uh, for all that you stand for and everything you do, and most of all, the spirit with which you do it. There, that, that is invaluable. There's nothing that can ever measure that up. So I just want to thank our beautiful, bright um, leaders and mentors and partners and uh, to, to the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ash, and thank you, Elizabeth, for such an inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Dr. Ash. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, as, a, as a pop youth mentor, I would like to say that today was such an enlightening and uh, a session full of so much knowledge and positivity and the kinds of solution you introduced to us, like even the smallest one and, 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 the, and, the, uh, and the solution that can bring up a big change at a policy level. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm so much inspired with your uh, session today and your presentation that uh, we would love to have you in future as well uh, when we do some capacity building ex uh, workshops or uh, in future when we invite people from across the globe uh, for conclaves and discussions. So because I think each, each and every second of your presentation was full of knowledge. So thank you so much. Uh, Let's make and, sure uh, everybody graduates from drawdown. I <laughs> I really I really believe that. I mean, I really really encourage every year and uh, those that are going to join later uh, that this is this is an invaluable invaluable resource and uh, and really is a great source of hope. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Doctor Ash. Um, well, now we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to uh, Ms. Elizabeth, our uh, panelists, and also to all the participants who joined us for this uh, session. We hope to see you in the next session, which will start in another 60 minutes, uh, which will be again project presentations by uh, POP uh, youth members. Um, thank you so much once again for joining us and see you all in the next 60 minutes. Uh, after that session, we'll have two more sessions before we close out the day. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. A warm welcome and, and thank you. Bye-bye.